Sundays actually took a break during December, did some different things there, but I felt like we needed to come back and finish it. And it's uh, basically, it's about what God says about the battle you're in. Every one of us has or will face a battle in our Christian walk. We are, uh, you know, uh, uh, as I've said many, many times during this series, we live in a day and a time when there's a lot of people that are preaching a easy believism as far as the gospel goes, that if you make a commitment to the Lord, that their life is peachy keen from that point on. Actually, some of the toughest battles I have faced in my life have been since I made a decision for Christ. Uh, it's, it's on a spiritual level rather than a physical one. And, uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes the enemy comes against us. Sometimes we face temptation. Sometimes we face things that we don't understand where they came from, why they're here, when they're going to leave. Um, the only thing that we can do is, is try to figure out some of the things that the Lord says about the battle that you're in. So we've been working on this for several weeks. We've actually been using Second Chronicles chapter 20 as our text for this particular series um, that we've been working on. And, and uh, Second Chronicles chapter 20 is uh, just to kind of give you the rundown. It's a time whenever the, the nation of Judah which was the southern kingdom. This was during the split kingdom. Israel was to the north, Judah to the south. Uh, Israel had gone, gone kind of wheels off nuts and stopped worshiping God, started worshiping idols, did not follow the Lord's commands, and they were headed down a bad path. Judah was still trying to do what they could to worship God, still trying to do things the right way. Their king was Jehoshaphat. And some of you have probably heard that name before, but Jehoshaphat was a good guy, tried to do what was right tried to follow the Lord's commands. Well, they come to him one day and they said, Lord, we are, you know, King, we are surrounded by your, all of our enemies. And there's no way of escape. There's no way around this. We are facing a terrible, terrible crisis here. And it tells us in Second Chronicles 20 that uh, Jehoshaphat was, was scared. He was very afraid because he didn't know what to do. And that was part of his prayer to the Lord. He said, Lord, we don't even know what to do. So... What he did was he called everybody to fast and to pray and seek the Lord. What should we do? The answer comes to this guy that was basically a, a, a nobody. He was a zero, but God got involved and he became a hero. And he had a word from the Lord. And that's where we're going to take up in Second Chronicles chapter 20. And he said, listen, all you uh, people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the uh, ascent of Ziz and at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions and then stand still. Watch the Lord's victory. He is with you. O people of Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. And then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites from the clans of Korath, uh, Kohath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. And early the next morning... The armies of Judah went out to the wilderness of Tekoa, and on the way Jehoshaphat stopped and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. Amen. We're going to look at it a little further. Let's pray before we get into the message. Father, we, we thank you already for having been here with us today. And dear Lord, I pray that you would let your word just come into our hearts and into our minds. And God, that we would be able to write it indelibly on our hearts. Lord, that we, uh, we could know what to do during the time of our crisis, the time of our battle. Lord, that we could take, take this as an example of how you want us to, to do things. And so, Lord, you write it indelibly on our hearts, and we're going to do our very, very best to follow it. And, Lord, we know that when we do, uh, everything's going to work out okay. You are God, and we are not. And so, God, we turn our lives over to you, and we ask you to accomplish great things in us and through us and for us. And, Lord, we thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. So, what we've been looking at over the last several weeks is what to do 
uh, whenever that battle comes, what God says that we should do whenever our time of crisis comes. So first of all, we want to realize that we're not alone. God's in this with you. You're not facing it alone. When you made a commitment to God, God's already made a commitment to you. He's going to be there with you through the thick and the thin. And uh, as I said before, people say they'll be with you through thick and thin. And when things get thick, they tend to thin out. God's not that way. God's going to be with you. He said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. Second thing, do not fear. It's going to be our first response whenever we hear something's coming our way, whenever we realize that, that there's a crisis at hand. First thing that's going to be our, our temptation is to fear. And that is not what God wants. Fear and faith are the total polar opposites, and they're both connectors. Fear is going to connect you to that negative. Faith is going to connect you to the good things that God has for you. Number three, don't be discouraged. That's the, as I said before, that's the opposite of being encouraged. Encouraged is being buoyant of spirit that no matter what life shoves our way, that we're just like a basketball in a pool. The further we go down, the quicker we're going to come back. Amen? Number four, the, realize the battle is not yours, it's God's. God is responsible for the outcome. Um, number five, position yourself. Uh, in, in other words, follow what God says. Do everything that he says in this word to be able to align yourself to be blessed. There's certain things that he says about uh, our salvation, that we need to connect ourselves to God, that we need to accept him as our Lord and our Savior. That's number one. If you are not saved... God is under no obligation to do anything about it. Amen? Now, he may hear your prayer and he may answer. God hears the prayers that anybody prays. He's not under any obligation if you do not belong to him to do anything about it. But here's the thing. If we will give ourselves over to him, he hears the slightest whisper of a prayer. And he's ready and willing to do something about it. So you've got to put yourself in the position to be able to be blessed. And... Then, what we talked about last week was remain in that position. Now, last week, I took advantage of Doug Kitchens. Those of you that were here saw that. I, I told him to stand up here, and then I went on with everything I was going to do. And Doug, like, I actually had several comments last week. They said, I thought you'd forgot about him. And how many of you have ever been in a battle, and you thought God forgot about you? How many times have you ever said, God, I'm praying why is it not changing? Are you there? Are you going to do something about it? And so I told Doug to stand, and what did he do? He sat down. <laughs> so remain in your position. And again, I apologize. I took a little advantage of Doug and knowing his personality because I knew he would be just like me, and he would find a place to sit down. So here's the thing. Sometimes we feel like God has forgotten about us. Sometimes... It's almost impossible for us to continue to stand. Sometimes we need help. I didn't even get there last week because I, I, I had so much to say and it kind of took a life of its own. Uh, if you all could see my notes on that particular point, it was about three lines and it just kind of just really, really got bigger than that. <laughs> but here's the thing. If you think about the time whenever the Israelites were going in to possess the land, and they were fighting their enemies. And they were going up against their, their enemies. And as long as Moses kept his hands up, what happened? They won the battle. They continued to progress on the enemies. Well, Moses, everybody just take your hands and stick them straight out in front of you. Both hands. Okay? And we're just going to hang out there for just a minute. Just thank you, Lord. We're just praising the Lord. And how many of y'all, somebody already, I didn't see one person move their hands down a little bit more. What happens? You get tired. All of a sudden, there's some of us that could probably hold them up for five minutes, but everybody's already probably feeling it just a little bit. And so here's the thing. Sometimes, to, for you to remain in position, you're going to have to rely on somebody else to help you. Aaron and her came alongside Moses. And they put, got, a, got a rock over there that he could sit on, and what happened? And every time he'd get tired and put his hands down, they'd start to lose. Every time he'd put his hands up, they'd win. So what happened? My arms are getting tired. I need help. I, I need somebody to help me. Merle, why don't you come help me? And Ronnie, you're, you're pretty handy. So they got Moses a place to sit down, and this battle went on for some time. 
So a man, Moses over here, he's sweating bullets, trying to keep his hands up. And he's, you know, and, and what happens? These guys come alongside him. And as long as Moses kept his hands up, the Israelites won. And, and every time he'd let them down. So sometimes for you to remain in the position that God has put you in, you're going to have to ask somebody for some help. You, none of us are lone rangers. Even the lone ranger needed Tonto. Amen? So what I'm telling you is sometimes we feel like we're the lone rangers of the cross. I've got to do this all myself. I don't need anybody's help. It's just me and God. And God says, I have put help all around you. If you don't get it, it's because you didn't ask somebody for the help. That's what, that's what I've talked about many, many times. Give, give my helpers, Aaron and her. Is that Ben, her? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> some of you catch that. <laughs> but what I'm telling you is, we come in here so often, and we need help, and we are on the inside, we are dying. And we come in and we paint on our smile, and somebody says, how you doing? Oh, I am so, I am just, I, I am just blessed beyond compare. And on the inside, we're, we're just screaming out, I need help. And we're too prideful. Our ego gets involved. No, we don't want anybody to think we're weak. We don't want anybody to think our prayers aren't getting heard. We don't want anybody thinking little of us. And sometimes what we need to do is say, I need you to come alongside me and help, my, help lift my arms up. I need your help to be able to see my way through this. I, I need your help to be able to get through this battle that I am in. And so if we don't take advantage of the help that God has already put around us, whose fault is it? It's ours. God says, I put all kinds of things in store. That's why, that's why when the church gets together, it, it's, 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 it's a special thing. The word in the Greek is kononia. And it means the fellowship or, or the gathering is really what it means. And that's, that's why it doesn't work for you to get your church on TV. Because there's no gathering. There's something that happens whenever we get together and we shake hands and we hug necks and we fellowship. And it's hard to fellowship when there's no fellas in the ship. Amen? If everybody stays home, if, if everybody stays away and just doing their own thing, guess what? We don't have that kononia. It's not a building. It is an entity in and of itself that whenever the believers of Christ get together, that there is something special that happens, that there is a connection that's there, that we can help one another, that we can build one another up, that we can encourage one another. It may not be a physical lifting up of hands, but sometimes there's just somebody in here that needs a hug. Somebody that needs a pat on the back and, and somebody to encourage them and saying, hey, I've been praying for you. And really been praying for them. Amen? And for those of you that know me very well, if somebody comes up and says, I want you to be praying about such and such, we usually stop right then and pray about it. Why? Because I'm afraid I'll forget about it. Amen? I don't want to say I'll be praying and not be praying. That's the worst thing that we can do. There is power when we agree together on something. And if it's nothing more than that, if it's nothing more than a hug or a pat on the back or an encouraging word, or, or you know, there's times whenever God puts somebody on my heart and I'll be driving and I'll call them. Hey, I didn't really want anything, just wanted to tell you I was thinking about you and praying for you. You know what that can do for somebody that's going through a battle? You know what that can do for somebody that's going through something and maybe they're feeling like God's forgotten them, that they're all alone and that they've got no way to get through this? That can encourage them. That can be the thing that pushes them on over into victory. Right there is knowing that somebody is standing with them. Amen? God has put us together for a reason. It is the fellowship of the believers. It is the gathering of the ones that know Christ. And it makes a difference in our life amen that's why uh, the writer of hebrews and i think it's the apostle paul he says forsake not the assembling of yourselves together and even more so when you see the day is approaching and folks i see and the things that are going on in our society and the things that are going on in our world that day is approaching when the lord is going to come back 
We need to be stronger than ever. We need to be helping one another more than ever. And to realize that sometimes somebody may need your help. Or that you may need somebody else's help to stay in the position that you are in. Yes, you might get discouraged. Yes, it might seem like God has forgotten about you. That you're just standing off to the side. And that He's not remembering where you're at, but He is. And sometimes our whole livelihood can depend on it. If you go all the way back to Abraham. And God made Abraham a promise. He said, your uh, descendants are going to be numerous as the sands on the shore or the stars in the sky. And Abraham was getting old. And he couldn't figure out how this was going to happen. And he felt like God was forgetting about him. He made he and Sarah a promise that they were going to have a child. And then by the time it happened, and God sent an angel their way, and he said, about this time next year, you're going to have a, have a son. What happened? Sarah laughed. How can a woman my age have a child? How old was she? Ninety years old. That's a little bit past the normal childbearing age. Amen? We'll just put it that way. And Abraham was ten years older than her. So he was a hundred. And so, you know, if, if you think about that couple for just a minute, 90 she was, 100 he was, it would run through your mind, um, God has forgotten about this promise that he made. Or it's going to happen in some way that I just can't figure it out. And that's exactly what happened with them. And so Sarah, just thinking about it all, and she says, I, I think I've got a way that this can happen. I've got a servant, a handmaid here, and I'm going to bring her to your tent, Abraham. And Abraham's like, yeah, 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 sounds good to me. <laughs> I mean, what, at what moment in time did this not seem like a good idea? I mean, that wouldn't, I'd know she was setting me up. Amen. It was like, no way. Even if it sounded like the best thing ever happened, it'd be like, no way. This is a setup. I wake up dead. What happened to me? <laughs> if I ever wake up dead, don't y'all say it. Had, what, how, that's what happened, okay? I'm just prefacing that. But they felt, like, they felt like God had forgotten them, that God had forgotten His promise, and that, that they had to do something on their own. Sometimes all you need to do is stay in your spot. Sometimes all we need to do is persevere. Sometimes all we need to do is, is stand still. That's what, he, that's what His instructions were. But we feel like we need to do something. We feel like we need to be figuring it out. God can do more in a split second than I can do in a lifetime. And so what happened was, Abraham's like, yeah, 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 sounds like a good idea to me. Here comes Hagar. She goes in with Abraham. The rest of the story you can figure out on your own. They have a child. And sometimes it totally, totally messes everything up. This whole mess that we are in today with the ISIS crowd and the terrorism that's going on is because Abraham and Sarah did not stand still. You take that in for just a minute. Everything that we're dealing with in this world today as far as evil is concerned, for the most part, because of the terrorism, because all of those people are descendants of Ishmael who was the child that was born from Hagar the, the handmaiden and Abraham. If Abraham just had stood still, if Sarah just had stood still and said, I can't figure out how this is going to happen. I'm 90 and you're 100. <laughs> it ain't looking favorable as far as the physical is concerned. But guess what? God can do anything. Just about the time you're ready to give up is a whole lot of the time whenever God does something. 
I sometimes think he thinks he waits till we come to the end of our rope before he's even ready to do anything. Because see, we're all the time, we're all about us. We're all about what I can do. We're all about our, our own gifts and our own abilities and the things that I can do in and of myself. And sometimes it seems like God waits till we're at the end of our rope before he even moves. You think about Lazarus. They sent, Mary and Martha sent word. Our brother's sick. The one that you love. He knew them. He stayed at their house. He was friends with them. They fed him. He slept at their house. They sent word. We know that you're a miracle worker. Come and do some miracles. Because Lazarus is sick. And what happens? Jesus waits another few days. And then, just about the time he's getting ready to go, he tells his disciples, Lazarus is asleep oh well that's good if he's resting no i mean he's really asleep he's dead and he comes up and martha meets him on the way lord if you'd only been here our brother wouldn't have died what did she feel like she felt like god forgot about him Lord, if you'd have just got it in gear and packed your junk up and got on down here, this wouldn't have happened, but he is dead. How many times do we dump on God like that? See, here's the thing. If you don't get anything out of today besides this, when something doesn't happen the way that we're planning on it happening, sometimes it's because God wants to reveal more about himself to us. Why did Mary and Martha send for Jesus when Lazarus was sick? Because they knew he was a healer. They had seen the miracles. They had seen him heal people. So ultimately, what do you want? You want a healing, so who are you going to send for? Who are you going to call? <laughs> Not Ghostbusters, you're going to call the healer. You're going to call the one that you know is a healer. But Jesus waited till he died, and why? What did he say to Martha? Do you believe that there is a resurrection? Oh, yes, I believe one day, pie in the sky by and by. Yes, one day we'll, we'll receive the victory. She probably got them jowls going a little bit. Yes, Lord, I believe. See, they already knew him as a healer. He wanted to reveal himself as the resurrection and the life. Because that's what he said. I am the resurrection and the life. And boy, we're all thrilled about that. I mean, it is a wonderful story. It's a wonderful thing. But here's the thing. There ain't many people standing in line to die so that they can be raised from the dead. Amen? I don't even think I'm in that line. And sometimes we think God's forgotten about us and we start doing our own stuff. I got to do something. Jesus isn't showing up. We, we've got to do something. And so sometimes our whole, our whole livelihood, our whole life depends on waiting and standing still. The hardest thing you will ever do for God. Guarantee you. Because we love to do for God. I love to do for God. When he said stand still, oh, it just hurts me. And you're probably the same way. We want to be busy. We want to be doing. And God says just stand still. And what's going to happen? We're going to see God work. That's number seven. Watch God work. He said see the salvation of the Lord. In other words, whenever God gets, gets on the scene, okay, we're standing still, we're out there, we've done what we're supposed to do. He didn't say sit in your tent, we had to go out there on the battlefield. We're facing the enemy. And then we've got to stand still. And what? See God work. We have been, in our world, we've been lied to, we've been conned, We've been gypped. We've been taken advantage of. 
Every one of us, in some way, shape, form, or fashion, every one of us is jaded about life. Some of us more than others. Some of you have been really mistreated and, and cheated and lied to and stolen from to the point that you don't, it's, it's hard for us to even see any good in this world. Sometimes if you've been involved in, in, in the criminal justice system at all, you see people and you say, how on earth can anybody do this stuff? Whenever, whenever I worked for TDCJ as a chaplain on, on, the, on the prison unit, it, I was like third in line. There was the warden, there was the uh, major, and I was between a captain and a major as far as rank, so I had access to everything. And sometimes because of the spiritual requests that people made i'd have to go and check out what they call their travel card and that is a basically this little catalog that follows an inmate everywhere they go and it tells about what they have put down as their spiritual preference so in other words if somebody said they were catholic and ordered a set of rosaries you had to actually go check out to make sure they were catholic and that they could have rosaries because if they said they were protestant then they didn't have any business with rosary beads amen follow me and on their, on their travel card was the stuff that they did to get where they're at. And you ever want to think that there's not evil in this world, get the opportunity to read somebody's travel card that's a, a sometimes fourth, fifth time convicted felon and the things that they did to get in there. And it's so easy for us to see life and to get jaded. And to believe there's no good in people. And, and all I've ever done in my life, this is what we say to ourselves, all I've ever seen in my life or done in my life or got in my life, I did it with these two hands. Nobody ever gave me anything. Anybody ever? You're getting awful quiet on me. <laughs> but we've been cheated and conned and lied to and manipulated to the point that sometimes it is so hard for us to see the good and the negative sells that's why if you turn on the news channel you turn on cnn headline news or you turn on fox or you turn on msnbc it's not all the warm fuzzy stuff that happened in the last 24 hours it's all the mean nasty rotten ugly stuff that's happened in the last 24 hours and how it's going to affect you come in stay tuned during the commercial and we'll tell you all about it does that aggravate anybody besides me I want to hear about it when I'm watching it. <laughs> I don't want you to go to a commercial and come back and tell me. But here's the thing. What we do is we have a hard time seeing the good. And I'm going to tell you something. God is working all around you. When he says stand still, a lot of times it's just because that's the only time that we're ever silent and not busy. If you want to hear from God, get alone with him and, and, and be still. Turn off the cell phone. Turn off the television. Turn off the radio. Sometimes in my vehicle is, is when God has spoken to me the most and it's because I get still and I'll turn that radio off and I give Him the opportunity to talk. I think God's talking all the time. I think, he, I think He's broadcasting, if you want to put it that way, all the time. And sometimes we get so freaky about that. Sometimes we, you know, somebody says, I feel like God's, oh, you're crazy. God talking to you. I mean, you can't see him. How can you know it's really him? But we don't get freaky. I mean, I've got this, this box that's in the middle of the dash of my vehicle. And I can turn that thing on and I can tune it to 95.1. On the, FM, on the FM dial, and I get country music. Does yours work the same way? Nobody else's? Somebody, Merle's does. Anybody else? You get in your car and you tune it 95.1, you're going to get... Well, that... I can't see that radio station. That guy says he's a DJ that's talking on there, but I, I've never seen him. And I mean, that truck's not connected to anything. But yet, somehow, mysteriously through the air, they're transmitting something. 
And it picks up on that little box in my radio, in, in, my, in my truck. They call it a radio. And we never get freaked out about that kind of stuff. I mean, at home, you've got this one little cable that comes in. And you get all those channels. But it's about having the right receiver. I can take my microwave outside, and it never picks up the, the country music station. I've tried plugging the microwave into that little cable. It just kind of makes sparks. What I'm telling you is you've got the receiver to hear from God. The problem is sometimes you're plugging the wrong stuff into it. And you're filling it up with the wrong stuff. And sometimes it's hard to get through all the junk to hear that still, small voice of God. And I truly do believe He's talking all the time if we'll listen, if we'll tune in to His station. And the thing is, if we get tuned in and we understand how God works and we begin to know God and we begin to experience God, then we begin to know His personality. We begin to know how He works. And I'll guarantee you, you're going to start seeing God in the strangest places. That you're going to see Him when you go to Walmart. That you're going to see Him whenever you go to work. And, and you're going to see Him in, in numerous, numerous different places. And all of a sudden, you're going to realize that God is working all around you. And sometimes all God is saying, if you'll just get still, you're going to see the salvation of God. Amen. It's worth a hand clap. If we will get our eyes fixed, if we'll put on the spectacles of heaven to be able to see God's hand at work, you're going to be amazed at the number of places that you begin to see Him. And so the thing is that sometimes, and it's, it's prevalent in church world, that we talk about the good old days, back when God used to answer prayers and heal people. I remember the altars being full. I remember God doing miracles. I knew one fellow one time that, that all he ever talked about was one time he saw a guy who was blind get healed. And he would talk about that. He, he, he saw that when he was probably 20 years old. And he was over 70. And he was still talking about that one time. And you know what? The writer of Hebrews said it 2,000 years ago and said it better than I. He said that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we'll get attuned to God and we'll begin to stand still and let Him do His work instead of us trying to do it for Him, then all of a sudden it's not going to be all those good old days it's going to be right now. Because see, you've come too late to tell me that God does not still do miracles. You've come too late to tell me that God still doesn't save people and that God doesn't deliver people whenever they ask to be delivered and that God doesn't reach down His hand and, and help the lame to walk and the blind to see and all those things that we read about in the Bible and that sometimes we, we pine away about in the past. God is still God. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He'll be God and He'll be the same after we're gone from here, but He's still the same today. And instead of saying, God used to do miracles way back when, we're going to be saying, hey, did you see that miracle God did today? Because what we've got to do is believe it. We've, we've got to understand who God is. And see, if you never ask God, you're not going to receive it. God is a gentleman. He never forces Himself on anybody. And sometimes we don't ask it because we don't believe it. If you don't know God is a healer, it's hard for you to ask for a healing. You've got to believe it first. And what I'm telling you is sometimes God has to get our attention. And sometimes God has to get us still and quit being in the frenzy 
and and being frantic like we are in our day and time there's so much stuff that needs our attention so many things that need doing and so many times and you're just like me sometimes you get up in the morning you hit the floor running and you feel like you're running in mud all day it's just like you're slow motion and i can't get enough done and then i do everything i can and then at the last thing at night i fall into bed and i start to pray And we've gotten up and we've lived our whole lives and we've not even spoke to God. If he spoke to us in an audible voice, we'd say, who's that? You got to take time for God. You got to know his word. You got to listen for his voice. And you got to understand everything that he's willing to do for us so that you'll know he can do it. I mean, there's times, and, and I know that everybody's pretty much the same, you, you, might, you might get sick in body. Maybe you're dealing with cold or flu or whatever, and you're just laying there and you're feeling so bad, and you think to yourself, is God really a healer? Can He still do what He did back then? And the thing that we've got to do is we've got to get our nose back in this book. And we've got to see that by His stripes, I was healed. It doesn't mean it's yet to come. It means that He's already provided it. And, and, and what we've got to do is take Him at His word. We've got to believe His promises. Roger, is He a healer? Amen. Roger, laying up there, the doctors had done giving up on Him, called in His family to say goodbye to Him, and you know what? He believed God at His word. I went up here to see Him that day, and Roger said, I'm, I'm walking out of here. <laughs> said, Amen. Let's let's agree (laughs) and there he is there's every one of you could probably tell tell a story like that but what i'm telling you is sometimes regardless how much your phone rings or how many texts you get or whatever's going on stand still and watch god work put on the spectacles of heaven and begin to see that world that that we sometimes are oblivious to. You know, Gideon goes out to fight the army, and he says, oh, we're just very few people. And he says, if you could see the multitude that was around you. And God gave him just for a minute the spectacles of heaven, and he saw that the angels were surrounding the enemy. There's a spiritual world out there that we're kind of oblivious to. And God's doing something all the time we just got to get tuned in got to quit trying to do everything that we can do to make it happen and stand still and see the hand of god work every head bowed every eye closed we might finish it next week (laughs) but this morning i just feel like I feel like there's somebody here that maybe you're going through a tough time and maybe even this week you have said, God, are you still a healer? Are you still a deliverer? Can you still do all those things that we read about in the Bible because I'm in need? Maybe you've done everything that you can do. I think God is saying to you this morning, stand still and watch the hand of the Lord work. I think God's saying, if you're at the end of your rope, you tie a knot and you hang hang on because help is on the way. As I've told you so many times, one of my favorite scriptures is, it came to pass. And it came to pass. Thank God it didn't come to stay. Whatever crisis you're in, whatever battle you're facing, whatever it is that's going on in your life, it didn't come to stay. It's not the way it's always going to be. Help is on the way. How many of you this morning say, Preacher, would you pray for me along those lines? Yes, yes, yes. Lots of hands, lots of hands. I'm going to pray about that, but first, you can go ahead and put your hands down. If you're here this morning and maybe you say brother philip i don't know god like you're talking about knowing him i i, I don't even know how to approach him I, I don't know how to pray i i don't know anything about it 
But this morning, I know that I want to make a change in my life. I want to be where God wants me to be. I want to receive everything He's got for me. I want to know this God that you're talking about. If that's you, and you say, I understand today, I want to make things right with God, would you just slip your hand up? Yes, yes, yes. Anybody else? Very quickly, yes, I see that hand. You can slip them up and back down. I'm not going to call you up front. I'm not going to embarrass you. You don't have to leave where you're at to get to where God is. But if you say, I want to make things right with God so that I can receive everything He's got for me, would you just slip your hand up? Yes, yes, yes. We're going to pray about that first. If you raised your hand, I want you to pray this prayer. You might have prayed it a thousand times. I want this one to... I I want you to mean it. I want it to stick. So that you'll leave here knowing and saying in your heart, I know God. I'm right with God. So if you raise your hand, I want you to pray this. Mean it from your heart. I want every born again believer to pray it with them. And just say this, Heavenly Father... I ask you today, come into my heart and into my life. I need you. You know the mess that I'm dealing with. I cannot do it by myself. Would you please come into my heart, into my life? Would you be my God and my Savior? Lord Jesus, I know what you did. You hung on that cross for me. You died in my place so that I could live. Thank you for your forgiveness, your mercy, your grace. Would you please lead me, guide me, direct me, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I thank you for loving me and saving me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Give the Lord a big hand clap for that this morning. And you know, here's the thing. Lots of hands went up when you said pray for me along those lines of just standing still, seeing God work. I think we all sometimes forget about that it's not up to us. Like I said last week, you know what what our responsibility is is obedience. We're not responsible for the outcome. The only thing we're responsible for is doing what God tells us to do. So let's pray about that, and then we're going to be dismissed. But Father, right now, every one of us, I think, could, could stand to pray this prayer. And God, we thank you for for loving us, for saving us, for being a part of our lives. But God, sometimes we, we take all the responsibility on ourselves. Sometimes we feel like it's up to us to do everything. And we feel like we are overwhelmed. And we're wondering where you're at and, and, and why you're not working on our time frame and on our schedule. But God, today, we understand you've got a plan. And however long we've got to wait, give us patience to wait. However long we've got to hang on to the knot at the end of that rope, God, it doesn't matter about anything other than the fact that you are with us wherever we are. And so, God, we know that great things are on the way. You've got great things in store for us. Help us truly, truly to see with the spectacles of heaven. Help us to know uh, what's going on around us and be attuned to you to know that all we got to do is stand still and watch you work. So, Lord, just, just put that in our hearts today to know that you're on the case. You've got, it, you've got it all in your hands, and we give it to you totally and just ask you to accomplish your perfect will in our lives. And, Lord, we thank you in advance because we have asked it in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said amen and amen. Give the Lord.